this second part of our interview with Tim Greenhalgh, Chief Creative Officer at Landor Fitch, we hear more about Tim's experience and views on how great brands need to be built. Now, over to Tim. You know, there's somebody there from Barnes & Noble, and the, the, new, the new CEO of Barnes & Noble was the fellow who started Daunt Books in the UK oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and taken on Waterston's. It was fascinating to hear about his story. He was saying basically his he started as a stockbroker. His wife said, "I don't want to talk about finance for the next forty years to so do something else." So he I, he himself had no direct experience in bookstores, but he bought that beautiful shop on uh, the Marlebone High Street, and, and uh, he basically said, "You know, it's just." He said, "I get invited to speak at conferences as if I'm an ex expert on book retailing." He said, "I'm not. I just use common sense." You know, and he talks about, for instance, this idea that every bookstore. Is a, it doesn't matter if it's part of a chain. Every bookstore is a community store. And what shapes that community store is the community and the staff who work in the store. So he said when he was approached by Waterstons to take over, he said there were commercial agreements in place with publishers where they paid money to put their books in the shelf. And he said there was absolutely no say from the staff on what should be in the store. He said, I completely changed that when I took over. And then he was, he was now recruited by Barnes & Noble to go and see about turning the business around. But what I thought was so fascinating was this idea that all of these really experienced people were saying, we've got to pay staff more. They've got to be more respected. They've got to be, they've got to be uh, um trained better that you know we have to value the customer one customer at a time and all of those fundamentals i thought was so interesting and i'm i'm wondering when you are talking to brands today you kind of alluded to it earlier but i'm really interested is is that idea of revisiting what we used to be about part of the conversation um uh, yes because i think it has to be I think the conversation starts off about how we can get greater efficiency, how we can how we can maximize sales and all those good things, which are understandable. But I think that, and I'll, I'll say it again, you know, our view is that the future of shopping is not retail, it's service. Retail mm -hmm. is merely the transaction. And the transaction can happen anywhere, whether it's at a till, on your computer, on your mobile phone, or on your smartwatch. So the transaction is becoming increasingly commoditized. The relationship, all the things you're talking about is through service. And so we very quickly, with a statement like that, start to talk to our clients about how, through either a person, through or maybe even just through tone of voice or digitally, we can give the customers the best service. Added on top of that, if you think about what we're talking about today, the number of clients now that are asking us to do on their behalf detailed insights into how the independent sector are behaving hmm. is becoming increasingly fascinating. Oh, because yeah, for sure. If you think about it, we've been locked down. And so guess what? We've been shopping locally and we've got to know Bob. And actually, Bob's a really nice guy. And in fact, yeah, this stuff's about, you know, 5% more expensive, but he's a lovely guy. I'm so glad he's not going out of business. He cares about the products he sells. He's just uh, he's just got his new daughter to start in the store. She's a lovely girl. She helped me, blah, 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 blah. And so the story goes on, which isn't a yeah. million miles away from your Dawn Buck story. But mm. the fact that we've become more aware of the added value we get from independence is now feeding into how bigger companies are thinking about how they can adapt their culture and their service sensibilities because the other aspect is i think during lockdown we became and this is a phrase i've used a couple of quite a few times now is we became a lot more considered and considerate as consumers we're being mm -hmm. far more considered in terms of what we see as essential do i really need that and also considerate in terms of you know the biggest subject at the moment on the planet which is the planet you know right. what are we doing to help the planet so can i shop with bob bob's only getting his product from 10 miles down the road versus something that's being flown in anyway i'm not going to start doing a david attenborough but <laughs> i think this idea of considered and considerate is quite interesting and looking at how independent brands and retailers behave 
has become a big trend for us. Do you know, it's funny, that segues beautifully into my next, my next question to you is, I spend quite a bit of time uh, looking at, and I've been very interested for a long time, in this, this kind of new market model, this direct consumer channel. Yeah. And um, what's interesting to me about it, first of all, is that over the years of working with many large brands, I've had, I can't even count the number of conversations with people at the likes of Unilever or P&G, you know, the idea of uh, how they would love to have their own retail channels. You know, because obviously they're at the at the mercies of a retailer like, a, you know, Walmart or Tesco, who's going to sell them at whatever price and not give them adequate you know, presence in the shelf, whatever it happens to be. So what's interesting about direct to consumer is a lot of these smaller brands have had to completely work around traditional channels. Yeah. And the way that they succeed, first of all, it's all digital. Secondly, it's it is it fundamentally requires you to have a great product. And it requires you to have great storytelling because you've, you're literally building a customer, you're building your business one customer at a time. And I, in the COVID bootcamp piece, I highlight the example of four amazing direct consumer uh, brands that have entered markets all within the last 10 years that have entered markets that are massively competitive in the areas of beauty, fashion, shaving. You know, they're literally applying some of the, you know, like, traditional thinking that used to exist uh, with new digital channels. And I was going to ask, in a way, when you were just talking about the idea that you're studying independence, I'm wondering if you have a thought or do you think that your clients who are being challenged by the likes of, you know, I, I don't know if you're, you probably are aware of this, but do you remember that ad that was created for the Dollar Shave Club? The crazy yeah. one. Yeah. So he spent $4,500 on that ad. Yeah. And uh, he, six years after launching, he sold the business for a billion dollars. So a year after he started, Harry's, the shave brand, yeah. launched. And they're now the number one selling razor in America, which I remember, I remember hearing the chief marketing officer for Gillette talk about the launch of a new blade. It cost them $200 million to develop and market this new launch. $200 million. And Harry's comes along and in nine years is the number one selling razor brand in America. I mean, it's unbelievable. So again, I'm wondering when you talk about studying independence and their kind of value and their and the way that they execute, I'm wondering, do you look at or, are you, or are, how are your clients adapting to these kind of new threats, direct to consumer uh, threats that basically are employing the kind of fundamentals that make a difference with consumers? So I think the answer to that question is um, that I think what we are studying is the art of being close to your consumer. Mm. Because what we can't do is say, there's an independent, look at what they do, now try and replicate that. Because you're a business of 100,000 employees with X number of overheads, blah, blah, X number of relationships you already have. So what we can simply do is learn, educate, practice, create touch points that help to facilitate the art of being closer to the customer. Because I think that's what we're talking about at the moment. So I still think that even if you're a massive organization or you're a one-off business that started yesterday, how you, how you think about your relationship with the customer is really important. And that's what I think we're trying to do. So whilst whilst we might be doing an independent study, I think what we're looking at, as I, I'll say it again, is this art of being closer to the customer. And I think that one of the things that we we try to do is to is to help our clients brainstorm around that, which doesn't come easy because there's too many. There's a lot of. I suppose when you're a Harry's, there's less distractions. Versus yeah. when you're a Unilever, there's a lot of distractions. Yeah. And so yeah. it's how can you have, you know, you've heard, we've talked about this before, how can I have a chief experience officer, a chief custom officer working in harmony to create the future of a business? Now, it's a nice idea, very rarely happens, but it's a lovely idea that you get experience and customer working in tandem. That would be, that would be Nirvana for me. 
Do you know what? Just a, as a quick side note, I, I did some consulting with a major brand that I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll keep nameless, but um, I remember they had a phenomenal strategic process internally. Uh, you know, they had a very deep, uh, the practice was led by consumer psychologists and they yeah. would do a lot of really thoughtful work around the way to motivate the consumer. And so you, you'd look at this kind of these strategies and you'd see genius and then you'd look at the execution in retail and you'd see uh, less than genius, put it that way. It still looked right. like a bloody pop play in a Walmart shop. Right. And uh, I thought, um, you know, and I guess more of an observation, it's really interesting to me that we can do the kind of work we do and and really reinforce the importance of understanding and seeing the consumer as more than a number on a spreadsheet. And you can find the insight that says this is what will move people. But then, as you say, the big these big companies have a lot of distractions. And if their channel is, you know, if the majority of their sales comes through a partner like Walmart, and Walmart says, you're going to do a pop-up and you're going to do it the way we tell you to do it. You know, all that insight is for naught if you don't yeah. actually have. Yeah. Which I think, again, it opens up really interesting opportunities. I was just reading something yesterday about uh, about a major uh, packaged goods brand who has just bought a, uh, a direct-to-consumer partner and is selling confection through them now and is looking to bring that physical experience, bakery experience into the store, as well as having the virtual experience. So it's interesting. I think there is, you know, there's moves afoot. I mean, you can't, if you're a normal bricks and mortar retailer, I think that you can't avoid looking at some of that data and say, we better start to listen to our partners more because our stores are the same as everybody else's stores here. And we got to enhance that experience. So I mean, that's, I, hope it I mean, there's a, you, you may be interested in, I hope this adds to the conversation we're having, but you know, the word I've probably used the most in the last 12 months, actually specifically when I've been talking to our creative staff, is I I think that we all need to be far more fluid in how we come up with our concept. And I think that's mm -hmm. as true for our clients as it is for us as an organization. Because I think a lot of what we talked about just in this last 30 minutes has been around not being so prescriptive about what you're what you believe you're trying to solve it's a much bigger answer to the problem which is going to rely on people who are anthropologists copywriters people who are excellent with product people who are excellent with marketing mm. of course that's always been the case but have they often worked in a fluid way together have they has the person who's responsible for marketing been as savvy about what product is about as much as how a digital channel can help to achieve that so I think, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm asking our people to be as wildly conceptual as they can mm. rather than just be really, really good at Photoshop. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I remember years ago we were working, I was working with a technology company and they had just brought in a new CEO from Silicon Valley and I was running the agency and then we showed up to present some concepts and we walked in the room. This guy turned and looked at us and said, oh, good, the arts and crafts people are here. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm hoping that, uh, you know, again, clients are waking up to the fact that you can't simply have a product in the right place at the apparent right plug right price that you've got to still be inspirational in the way the consumer yeah. is willing to yeah. see you as a brand. So my last question, Tim, is this, um, what would you be, what would you predict will be critical first steps um, to emerge and then maintain an advantage going forward after COVID? So if COVID has rattled our cage, we're now coming out of it. What do you think are the critical first steps to maintain that advantage going forward? So. Um, that's a that's a that's a very interesting question. People always say that's an interesting question when they're trying to use the time to think of the answer. <laughs> um, I don't like to I don't like to send the question in advance. I want to see uh, your unvarnished thoughts. I mean, I critically. Well, I think we have been in a significant period of restriction. We have been in a significant period of dislocation. I love that word. You know, I love mm. the fact that we we're not quite sure what is where. You know, 
is my shop there or is my shop on my laptop and all that kind of stuff. Mm. So I think that the the priority will have to be two things which are almost completely opposite. One, I think, is said the sense of reassurance of we're still around, we're still good value, we're still we're still your champion. But I think that there's almost a sense of while you've been away, we've been tinkering. The elves have been at work, and here is some new ideas. Here's a new way of shopping. Because I think just to present what was there before in a post-COVID world, I don't think it's believable, if I'm perfectly mm. honest. Because I think that we've all in some way changed a bit. I think we've all suffered, but I think we've all grown. And I think we've all shifted some of our priorities. And I think that we understand now what we want from a consuming experience. So yes, there's all the predictions about how we're all going to go mad. And to an extent, that's proven not to have actually been true. There was a few blips where people were... But I mean, now that the, now that the, the restrictions are easy, I think we're looking for brands to show us a new, more carefully thought out way. And I think my final answer to your question would be, we are going to, I believe, that the winners are going to be the best storytellers. Yeah, that is really interesting. You know, there's a great stat that I came across, which was at the peak of COVID in a 90 day period, the rate of uh, development of online shopping grew in what the analysts thought would would actually take 10 years originally. Really? So in 90 days, 10 years of growth yeah, yeah. and adoption yeah. had been. So you think to yourself, you know, I, I never meet people that say, I've got tons of time in my hands. I got more money than I know how to spend. Everybody's got too little time and too little money. And so the reality is that if you're now conditioned to go and find convenience and find, find price online, you know, and if you weren't doing it before, amazingly, and you're doing it now because of COVID, you know, the idea that you're going to accept, as you say, something that's less than exceptional going forward <clears throat> from a retailer or from any business, I think is when you think about, again, uh, what COVID has done, plus the new entrance from direct to consumer brands. Yeah. yeah. I think it is. I think it is really putting a fire under the feet of businesses today to really think, hold on a second, guys, we cannot let the complacency of our culture and way of doing things uh, kill us because it will kill us if we don't change, adapt or die. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you know what, I, I'm looking forward to those changes because I think for, for people in, in your position, my position, it creates amazing, exciting opportunities. So here's to that change. So Tim, I just want to thank you again. I love talking to you. I love seeing you. And I really want to say thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your ideas with us. Uh, it's very much appreciated, my friend. Thanks, Rob. Thanks so much for sticking to the end of our two-part interview with Tim Greenhalgh, Chief Creative Officer of Landor Fitch. What I love about this interview is that Tim has seen the evolution of brand effectiveness over a more than 30-year career working with some of the greatest companies in the world and was able to share his view on what it will take to stay relevant and beloved by consumers in the crazy time of change that we live in. And whether you're an established business or one starting out, your ability to compete ultimately relies on building more profound connections with consumers. The market is open for business. On a closing note, I'd like to give a big shout out to my amazing sponsor, the Innovation Hub at Carleton University, dedicated to helping create leaders like Tim Greenhalgh. Find out more at www.carleton.ca slash innovation hub. And please remember to hit like and subscribe for more great stories of inspired entrepreneurs. Thanks for paying attention.